And we just thank God for this wonderful program, this wonderful people. I always say on Sunday mornings, hello, wonderful people. I want to make sure everybody heard that. <laughs> Brother Kit, you, you heard it, didn't you? Okay, amen. Praise God. I've been drafted to uh, introduce this wonderful speaker uh, by Sister Barbara and Terrell. They both um, threatened me to be very short. But Dr. Fred Allen, I've been knowing him over 20 years. I knew him in the North Alabama Conference, and I have known him here. He's done a lot of work. He has pastored over 52 years. I say he has pastored over 52 years, amen? And he has retired, but not tired. Amen? Amen. amen. I thank God for him for being a preacher of the word, passion for all God's people, and always being a positive presence for the greater good of humanity. Amen? Amen? The next voice you hear would be none other than the Reverend Dr. Fred Allen. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to express my deep and sincere appreciation to the design team for inviting me and to um, allow me to be a part of this historic gathering. I want to thank Bishop Taylor for the invitation as well for me to be a part of the Holston Conference and for the SBC 21 to be in partnership with you. I also want to express my sincere appreciation. Words will not express it adequately. But some of you know that I lost my daughter a couple of months ago, and I think, Reverend uh, Kitchen, you did as well. <clears throat> I received many, many cards and expressions and words of encouragement. That sustained us my family and I. So I want to thank all of you for lifting us up in prayer. Uh, it was a shock. And those of you who are parents, it's a double shot when you have to send your child to everlasting home going. So thank you very much. In the context of not just Black History Month. I want to make sure that I've got this right. Okay. In the context of Black History Month, but also in the context of the purpose for our gathering here. And in light of the political and social, economic, theological climate and landscape of the day, I was reminded of a favorite prayer of mine that I'm going to share with you trying to use the idiom of our four parents who were victimized by slave and insidious brutality. It's called, and as much as ye have done it, this ain't Jane's prayer. She was an old Negro woman apparently of the lowest type. Over the white wool on her head was tied a dingy 
dingy handkerchief. Her dress was two cotton waists put on one over the other so that the holes and rents came in different places. The skirt she had on that Sunday morning was a gift from Northern Barrows, as was her white apron. This was her only bit of Sunday finery. The home she had left that Sunday morning was not more than 12 feet square. A low clapboarded shed with a square hole for a window closed by a wooden shutter. The chimney was of sticks daubed with clay. Her furniture was a bunk filled with pine needles and covered with pieces of carpet and quilt and a little pail and a number of empty tin meat cans and a saucepan through whose holes she had drawn rags to stop them up. Her breakfast that Sunday morning was dry harmony. It was really dry. It was very dry harmony. Didn't have any salt pork, fat, skim, milk, which in many of the homes that day constituted their very, very amount of luxury. She had walked more than a mile that Sunday morning through the dusty, dirty roads. But she had this mannerism and she cursed it as she entered the church. She sat down many, many, many others like herself who were equally as poor as herself and she listened to the chapter read, the leader of the meeting asked her to pray, and she knelt down. Dear Massa Jesus, we allins beg on you come make us a call this ye day. We is nothing but poor Ethiopian people. And they don't think much about we. Remember the context, the landscape, the political, the social, theological, religious landscape for which we are now encountering and experiencing. Particularly the black people. We as put we is nothing but poor Ethiopian women. And people ain't think much about we. We ain't trust any of them great high people for come to we church. But you is the one great Massa, great to much than Massa Lincoln. You ain't shamed to care for we African people. Come to we, dear Master Jesus, dear Master Jesus, come. The sun, he hot too much, the road am that long and boggy sandy. And we ain't got no buggy for send and fetch on it, but Master Jesus, Master. You remember how you walked that hard walk up Calvary? And ain't weary, but think about it. We all that way, weary. Yeah. We know you ain't weary for to come to we little church, Master Jesus. 
we pick out the thorns, the brickles, the briar, the backslidden and the quorum, and the sin out of you past so they shan't hurt on us pierced feet no more. Come to we, dear Master Jesus, come. We all ain't got no good cool water. Forgive you when you're thirsty. You know, Master, the drought so long and the well so low. Ain't nothing but mud to drink. But you know what, Master Jesus? We going to take the communion cup and fill it with the tears of repentance and love clean out of we hearts. So come, dear Massa Jesus, come. We so glad to have you here. Can you feel Jesus? Can you feel him in the room now? Do you feel Massa? Master Jesus, you say you're going to stand to the door and knock. Well, you ain't going to stand at we door, Master, and knock. We set the door plain open, wide open, so you know you're welcome to come into our little space, Master Jesus. We set the door plumb open. Sisters and brothers, turning to one another. And this slave woman in this little holy temple Shouts out to her sisters and brothers, why are you so quiet? Open the door and tell Master Jesus he welcome. Men and women rose to their feet. Open up the doors. Says, Master Jesus, you're welcome. Come in. Come, Master Jesus, come. We know you is near. In spite of all of the hell and all of the brutality and all of the dehumanization and the humiliation that we experience, we know. We know you care about us. We know you is near. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. No height. No depth. No width. No snow. Separate us from you, dear Jesus, Massa. Thank you. And you know, every time I think about that prayer, my heart just tremble. 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 Because I know personally. but without the grace of God. Six years ago, I didn't even know I would be here. I had a stroke. Had no mobility and dexterity in my fingers and my hands. 
And I had to lean on. Not only the crutch, but I had to lean on Jesus. Who gives these to a troubling heart. I know the massa is close. And come hell or hot water. I know Jesus is a way maker. He, he, he insists upon jubilee freedom. Jubilee freedom today. Now at this point, I, I want to just talk to you. I, I want us to be informed and challenged by what's happening in our church. What's happening in our churches locally? What's happening in this annual conference? What's happening in the general church? And what might happen in May of this year? And I want to preface everything that I'm about to say on the principles of Jubilee and Jubilee Freedom. And, and it's important that we understand the concept of Jubilee, which is drawn from the book of Leviticus, in which a year of Jubilee is celebrated every 50 years, of which we celebrated a year ago in this church, Jubilee. This Jubilee period is sacred. It's a holy time. It is a time of freedom, of celebration, when everyone will receive back their original property. And slaves will return home to their families. And I was reminded, Bishop Taylor, when you showed the clip of Pete in Ohio, this rich man who felt an obligation and a responsibility to give back. During the Jubilee year, social inequalities are rectified. Slaves are freed. And in these contemporary times, if you read Alexander's book, this, grand, this Jim Crow mentality and this Jim Crow experience that prevails beyond the dismantling of it theoretically. There's a new kind of slavery that's going on in our society today. You talked about death row and you talked about men on death row and the disproportionate number of black men in particular. Yes, yes. We've got over 4 million black young men incarcerated today. Yes. And just mercy yes. is the epitome of what's happening to many of our men. Thank God that Jubilee Freedom occurred and was depicted in the film that was a reality that an innocent man was about to be killed, yeah. executed. Yeah. You know of anybody else who was innocently killed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who had done no wrong? Yeah. Had nothing but love and grace and mercy in his heart and yet? Y'all yes. 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 know of any innocence? Jubilee freedom means land is returned to its original owners. Many of our churches and much of the wealth of the United Methodist Church 
has been accumulated and acquired on the backs and the lives of slaves Our mamas and daddies and grandmamas and granddaddies. And their mamas and their grandmamas and daddies gave their lives for this great church, for this great institution. Do you believe freedom is tough? Do you believe freedom also means that debts are canceled. What may be the foundational principle of Jubilee is forgiveness. I, I'm, I think I'm about the only one in a tie here, so. <laughs> I'm going to do a little freedom here, <laughs> a little liberation. But one of the most, and I'll talk about this in a personal context a little later, but one of the most difficult things about Jubilee is forgiveness and reconciliation. How, how do we reunite authentically? You talked about your neighborhood, Rusty. Not that we don't see color, but color should not be that factor that creates the, the gap and the divisiveness and the polarization. Jubilee is freedom that frees one from disgrace. Free to claim forgiveness and redemption. Free to embrace other cultures and other races. And free from fear of touching and connecting with other persons who are divinely different but beautifully created in the sovereign image of God. Everybody in this room, and you need to know this, I don't care how old you are, or how young you are, how fat or skinny. I don't care whether you're gray or black. Head full of hair or no hair. In the, in, the, in the sight of God, everybody is somebody. Everybody is equally as important. And everybody has been created in the image of God. And if you fail to see the beauty in God, my brother... Then you missed the whole point. Because yeah. everybody is somebody with equal worth, equal value, and equal importance. Yeah. Your zip code has nothing to do yeah. with your connectivity with the God Almighty, the sovereign divine creator. Whether you're in a big church or a little church. Whether you're a big preacher or a little preacher. <laughs> Our theological concept at least mine is, is rich in hope. Born out of grief. Born out of pain. Born out of suffering. And even in the midst of all of that hell, In all of that darkness, 
in all of that pain, I have hope in my heart. I have hope in my life. In spite of, I know that God's creative purpose will not be defied by anything, any mindset, any mentality that we have created that has divided us. Because my belief is in the eternal hope of a God who defeated death. Who defeated the grave. Who got up from his little nap. And walked again. My hope is a transformative hope, which takes its historical context from my desire for change. Since the United Methodist Church has just recently celebrated its Jubilee year, it is most befitting that we focus on this concept as we approach the 2020 General Conference. Black United Methodist Churches lay in clergy, we must continue to dream. We must continue to have the vision, have the hope to envision the body of Christ. Listen to this. The body of Christ which is unfettered by racism and unencumbered by human sexuality, but truly comprised of all of God's children. After passage of the traditional plan of the 2019 special session of General Conference and additional plans being drafted for presentation at the upcoming General Conference, it is urgent and absolutely imperative that the General Conference and the entire UMC constituency hear and embrace the concerns and the positions of Black United Methodist. Many Black lay and clergy have been in conversation about identifying as many possible options for negotiating the sustainability, security, and the preservation of the life and ministry of black United Methodist churches across the connection and across the globe. I have noted, and I'm sure you have, the continuity of the black church and black preaching in the United Methodist Church and in the United States from its very earliest practice we have focused on freedom. But these exhortations on freedom had two prone emphasis. Freedom from sin and freedom from slavery. Black churches and their ministries continue to emphasize both conversion from sin and release from the oppression, the brutality, and the dehumanization that continues as a result of American slavery and its legacy of racism. If you've not seen Just Mercy, let me strongly encourage you to see it. But I also want to reference another epic production, and that's Harriet. Yes, yes, yes. A depiction of the human condition at its worst, because the main storyline embodies the horrors of slavery and dehumanization of a people. Harriet, 
graphically portrayed a horrific reality of the slave trade that chronicled a systemic process of kidnapping, selling and slaughtering tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of African males and females of all ages. The movie reflected two equally disturbing characteristics of the human condition. First, it depicted a vivid description of the diaspora, the scattering of people with a common origin, background, and belief. Diaspora has been used historically to disclose the experience of the Jews who were dispersed from Judah in the 6th century and exiled in Babylonia, 587 to 483 BC. It is now also used to define the forcible dispersal of African people, uh, descendants of Africa, beyond the boundaries of this continent of America, all over the globe. And if you've traveled, as I have, in Europe, Central America, South America, Africa, the experience is very similar to what I experience here. I hope you hear me. The second thing, and I'm going to move quickly into the slides. The epic Harriet reveals the establishment of the peculiar institution of shadow slavery in America. Aside from the violation of human rights and civil atrocities akin to modern day war crimes, slavery's victims were robbed of all wealth and worldly possessions, inheritances, and real estate. I'm going to share with you a resolution that I have submitted to the General Conference entitled Jubilee Freedom Today. And it talks a little bit about property and the distribution of wealth in our church. But more broadly, there will be a huge transfer of wealth and power now and in the ongoing future. And so, when Donald Trump talks about tax cuts, Most of the black people I know are still struggling with how to keep their lights on. In spite of what Donald Trump says about the unemployment, black people that I know, many of them are still working two and three jobs. I ain't lying. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. Our neighborhoods are still victimized by a lack of infrastructure that cares about our education of our young children. I ain't lying. And those of us who have quote gotten over the hump, unquote. Don't forget. Don't forget. We have a responsibility. We have an obligation to go back home. Yeah. 
Some of us have been so guilty. I ain't going to speak to her. I ain't going to speak to him. The hell with all of that. God cannot use it. Arrogance. But humility is the key. Get down there with them. Remember where you've come from. I ain't lying to you. There are myriad social elements residing from the horrific injustice of the diaspora and institutional slavery. Throughout the annals of history, there is not to be found any institution and practice of slavery as insidious as the system of slavery that we have experienced. African slaves were brought to America against their will. You know the story. I'm trying to cut through. My wife always tell me, Fred, you spend too much time. You don't have that much time. It's terrible. Reverend, Reverend, are you looking at it? <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip about eight pages. One, two, three, four. Not quite eight, but I do want to read this resolution. Four, five. Let me just start right here. I think I skipped about six pages. <laughs> Our great United Methodist Church is struggling with a number of models and structures and proposals that are coming down the pike. But we're all attempting to change, at least I think, to create a way by which we do not stain God's house. I remember when I went into the ministry in 1968, my daddy, who was a seventh grade scholar, but a smart man, his brother was sharp, boy. Taught, he was a self-taught x-ray technician, radiology. Never went to school. He was a janitor. Had a little cubby hole in the basement of the building where he worked. And watched his boss do x-rays. And he had a little three, street, three ring binder, little notebook. And he started taking notes, and he would stay up. I remember seeing Daddy just scribbling in his little book. Didn't know what he was doing. But as it turned out, Daddy became the preeminent x-ray technician in Nashville, Tennessee. They called on Daddy, who was uneducated, untrained, no credentials, to, to perform the most complex and difficult x-rays and picture taking of the body ever. My point is, I believe that we are trying to find a way to save from staining God's house, no matter what prevails. I'm going to assume 
at least my attempt, is to find the best possible path for God not to be ashamed of who we are as the church of Jesus Christ. So, I'm suggesting that before we are seduced by various factions, y'all hear me? Before we are seduced by various factions, we need to remember what our priorities are and what our mission is, and that is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And Rusty, you gave us the two greatest of all commandments. To love God. With all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And to love your neighbor as you want to be loved. So we need to remember what our mission and our priorities are and how can we achieve them. How can we best achieve them? As stated earlier, I'm urging the 2020 General Conference and the entire United Methodist Church to support some of the concerns of black United Methodists as reflected in my resolution, which has been endorsed by the six national ethnic plans, the Interethnic Strategic Development Group, Black Methodists for Church Renewal, the Black Clergy Women, and the Convocation for Pastors of Black Churches. So I'm now asking any delegates here, and I'm asking the General Conference, to join forces and join hands by embracing and supporting the resolution, which reads, Be it resolved that the 2020 General Conference of the United Methodist Church take action to maintain and to enhance our identity as the United Methodist Church by embracing a full and diverse membership which empowers all constituents, lay and clergy, especially racial, ethnic, groups seeking to establish and strengthen congregational life, endeavoring to engage in multicultural ministry, better integrating diverse congregations and multicultural staff. I heard you, Reverend Williams, talk about the number of, of the lack of numbers of blacks in strategic decision-making posi positions in this annual conference. How can we change that? How can we improve that? Which is the essence of what I'm trying to suggest in the resolution, but not just in the host and conference, but throughout the connection. How can we better integrate our various constituents and placing them and electing them to strategic decision-making positions in the church at the general level, at the annual conference, jurisdictional, and the district levels. How can we create an equitable formula for clergy appointments? For many of us in this room have a ceiling, a very low ceiling, I'll say it again. Many of us in this room and across the connection experience a very low ceiling for advancement. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not exempting or wavering, waving qualifi qualifications, commitment, and dedication. And I'm going to offer some challenges to all of us, either now or a little later. But I'm saying, and I don't mean, I don't mean tokenism either. 
And I don't want you just to appoint folk that can always say yes. Well, we really mean hell no. Uh, you all have to forgive me. I, I'm, a, I'm a barbershop preacher. And, 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 and if you're in a black barbershop, the Sunday school language is a little different than what it is when you're sitting in church on Sunday morning. But it's still a spiritual place. The language is just a little different. And we need to learn how to decode it and to understand where it's coming from and why. So let me get back. I'm, I'm getting off track. An equitable formula for appointments, including cross-racial lead pastor appointments and extension ministries. This resolution, I believe, will hold the church accountable to its global social principles and biblical mandates regarding people of color and ministry to the poor as it goes through its transformation to become the beloved community of God, incorporating the rich legacy, heritage, and contributions of the black church. Be it further resolved that regardless of what churches that choose to disaffiliate may do so under the principles of biblical jubilee, without penalty, without retribution, and without harm. One of the most disturbing things about the result of the acquittal of Donald Trump was what seemingly appears to be vindictive, malicious payback. And I'm hoping that whatever happens at this general conference, that we will not take on a spirit of malicious vindictiveness and payback. Vengeance belongs to God. God will separate the wheat from the tares. God will make the final judgment ultimately. The resolution will hold, I think, the principles of the Bible together. I am also suggesting that it further be resolved that disaffiliation, and that's not a word that I am advocating. The last thing I want to see is our churches separating. I, I don't I don't and I pray in spite of all of what seems to be the signs of separation I hope and pray that we can keep our family together we've come too far we've given too much I still believe that the black voice, I still believe that the black presence, I believe that the black spirit is still that powerful force in the church that helps us come to grips. We don't have to always agree, but I think God has given us that call upon us to keep the majority, the dominant group, sensitized and more sensitized to the historical and current injustices of the day. So, I'm not 
proposing this affiliation. But if there are churches that desire to do that, hope there will not be any retribution. I hope there will not be any harm that might come to them, whoever they are. In the event that black churches and other racial ethnic UMC churches feel led to disaffiliate, I hope certain conditions encompassing the principle of Jubilee should be enforced. Number one, the church's property deeds to be released from the UMC to be legally owned by the congregation under its property deeds as an act of repentance and reparations. Number two, all UMC national ethnic plans, Africa University, the Black College Funds, be fully funded for the next 12 years, no matter what new configuration or shape the church may take to guarantee the survival and growth of remaining existing and emerging congregations to ensure the national plans can continue their missions and have full representation and voice in the policy making decisions of the church. Also, the church will continue to recognize and support the five racial ethnic caucuses. BMCR, Pacific Islanders, the Latino, the Asian American. Number three. Biblical Jubilee will become the normal practice of freedom and of celebration when every member, lay and clergy, will experience just and equal opportunities in all units and all program areas of the church, including parity in clergy appointments and staff assignments. Four. Debts of arrears and apportionments and benefits are canceled. You all remember when I started this Jubilee concept and where it came from and how? But listen to the rationale behind it. There are small rural churches and there are urban churches that are going through gentrification, unemployment, demographic changes, economic instability that has prohibited them from paying their full apportionments. And again, I have served churches in Tennessee, churches in Kansas, churches in New York. Not one year, even when I was in seminary, did I not lead my congregations into paying full 100% apportionments. And I'm strongly encouraging all of us to do likewise. However, the metrics ought to be a little different depending upon the economic realities and conditions of particular local churches in rural and urban communities where ex exponential injustice economically and politically might be occurring. So we'll have to sort that out. But at any rate, if they are experiencing severe financial crisis, substantiated due to such current realities as gentrification, regentrification, unemployment, aging, demographics, imprisonment, etc. Number five, and I'm about through. More intentional and consistent programs of recruitment, training and empowerment of more youth and young adults to commit to follow their call of ordained and lay servanthood ministry should be established. We ain't going to make it. I can't do what I used to do. <laughs> Even right now, I feel a little <laughs> something in this hip. <laughs> Anybody know what I mean? <laughs> so
So it becomes imperative that we institute with sincerity and deep commitment to how we begin to nurture, solicit, recruit, train our young folk, youth, young adults in particular, to take on the role of ordained ministry, staffing positions in annual conference, who has developed the gifts and the skills to keep up with modern day way by which we communicate, by which we outreach, etc. We must, we must find a way to get our young folk in the church. Number six, and lastly, to grow into being a global church in polity, organization, and spirituality. I am convinced that uh, you, you know, I, I came up in the era, and some of you did, doing the Tarzan. Anybody know Tarzan? And Jane? <laughs> and, and what our view was of the jungle and what our view was interpreted by Tarzan and Jane, who the African people were. I believe that we have always been connected to God. I believe that our cultural experience with God has always been authentic. And so the reason that I'm saying global is because even some of us look at our African and Caribbean sisters and brothers as less than. They eating that kind of food? <laughs> Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. I've heard it. <laughs> I ain't gonna eat that. <laughs> you get hungry enough, you'll eat it. Anyway, uh, we need a global church in polity organization and spirituality. When conferencing and allocating funds, the church consider our unique cultural and political differences which affect decision making at general conference and to fund ways to improve communications, cultural competencies, global travel, clergy and lay training as well as program development. I know I said that was the last one, but it's a further be resolved as a closing statement. That biblical jubilee will become the norm practice of freedom and of liberation when every member will experience just and equal opportunities in all units and program areas of the church, including parity in clergy appointments and lay staffing assignments. <laughs>